everybody. I am Arthur Avila. I'm here to present uh, our last speaker, uh, last plenary speaker of this uh, ACM, Svetlana Zhitomirskaya. Svetlana Zhitomirskaya was born in Kharkiv and uh, did a PhD with uh, Yasha Sinai at the Moscow State University. She spent most of her career at uh, the University of California in Irvine. Uh, she's joining uh, Georgia Tech as Hubble Chair uh, just shortly. Uh, Svetlana has uh, made deep contributions to dynamic systems and mathematical physics. She has used hard analytic techniques to tame small denominators arising in the spectral tier of uh, Schrodinger operators. Her work on a metal insulator transition for the almost Matthew operator set the direction of the field for years and attracted many people like Jean Bourgain. Working with him, she achieved the proof of the continuity of the Lyapunov exponent, which has a fundamental property in dynamic techniques that were used in approach later on by herself and many others. Her recent work introduced new approach to deal with the notoriously hard critical part of the spectrum. She has been honored many times, for instance, with the Danny Heinemann Prize, and just this year, with the uh, becoming a member of the National Academy of Science, and just very recently getting the inaugural Olga Ladizanskaya Medal. Uh, now I turn, uh, I let uh, Svetlana present her talk, which is uh, called uh, Small Denominators and Multiplicative Jensen's Formula. So uh, this is an ICM talk, and I'm supposed to say something that will appeal to all mathematicians. And if you think about that, uh, what is there that all mathematicians like to do? Of course, all mathematicians like playing with numbers. So let's do that. Let us list square numbers. Everybody knows what they are. And let us list triangular numbers. Also, everybody knows what they are. And now, let us ask a question. How many triangular numbers are there between successive squares? So uh, you see between uh, one and uh, four, there are two numbers, one and three. We count the left one, but not the right one. All between four and nine, there is, uh, uh, there is one number, six. Between nine and 16, there are two numbers, 10 and 15. So you obtain a sequence like that. And then it is uh, very easy to see that there cannot be anything larger than two, and there cannot be two twos in a row or three ones in a row. So everything splits into uh, groups of two ones and two one ones. And now we can ask a question, how many two ones are there between successive two one ones? So let's see, the first two, one, one, that's this. So the first number is two, then one, then two, one, one, and you obtain another sequence. And you see that it is the same exact sequence as before. So then you can repeat the process, right? You can again split it into two ones and two one ones, and uh, continue it ad infinitum. So you see there is this nested structure, self, nested self-similarity in this business. And I end this slide with welcome to the quasi-periodic world. Of course, you may ask, what does it have to do with quasi-periodicity? Uh, you may want to ask that, but you cannot because it's an ICM talk and questions are not allowed. Uh, at least not until the end of the talk. Okay, so I uh, want to represent here discrete one-dimensional quasi-periodic Schrodinger operators. I'll say a few words about uh, multidimensional things, but my main subject will be one-dimensional quasi-periodic Schrodinger operators, and my goal is to convince you that it's a very interesting object. And these are operators of such a form. So f is a periodic function. <laughs> and uh, so this is just such a simple operator. 
Not, it is not a discretization of anything. It's actually an operator that appears as a model in physics, and I'll explain in a second how appears in its own right. But mathematically, we are interested in questions that, again, are motivated by physics, but I will not explain how, by property, spectral properties of these operators, namely metric and topological properties of the spectrum, various spectral decompositions, quantum dynamics. Now, this seems to be simple enough, but I want to note that this topic has already been quite represented at, at the past ICM talks. So I just counted at least all those talks by these colleagues. So this is at least number eight, where these uh, models feature prominently, uh, either fully or partially. So for this reason, I will mainly concentrate on uh, just explaining some things uh, that uh, I, I cannot possibly talk about all given uh, full overview of all the wonderful developments, even the, later, the latest developments, but I'll just talk about a couple of selected topics that currently excite me the most. Now, I promised to say about physics origin, and here it is. So even though the operators we will be talking about are one-dimensional, they actually come from the study of two-dimensional materials. And the first model we will talk about, so let us start with something very simple. It's a discrete two-dimensional Laplacian. So it's an operator on L2 of the lattice Z2, just given like that, so you can think of it. So normally when you think of a Laplacian, you would want to divide, <laughs> to subtract uh, something like four times the diagonal term, but it doesn't matter for bounded operators. This is just a shift, it uh, doesn't matter. So we just keep it like that for simplicity. So again, as I said already, this is not a discretization. It comes uh, from physics. It's so-called tight binding model of an electron in a uh, two-dimensional crystal. And the spectrum of this operator is integral minus 4, 4. So let me briefly remind what the spectrum is. Uh, uh, spectrum is... Uh, not just a collection of eigenvalues that some people might think, but uh, spectrum is defined as the set of E such that H minus E does not have a bounded inverse. And a quick example is a multiplication operator. If you have a measure space and the operator acting on L2 of this measure space, just multiplication by a function F. And then it's very easy to figure out what the formal inverse is, and therefore uh, E's are in the spectrum if and only if this is not a bounded operator. And that means that the spectrum is just the essential range of the function f. And this is, uh, spectrum is a unitary invariant, this is important, and the uh, central theorem and the spectral theory is that Every self-adjoint operator is actually unitarily equivalent for an operator like that for some f and some measure space mu. So this is not just an obscure example. This is a central example in some sense. And this is why it's very easy to figure out the spectrum of this discrete two-dimensional Laplacian, because by just taking Fourier transform on both variables, you see that it is unitarily equivalent to multiplication by 2 cosine x plus 2 cosine y on L2 of the two-dimensional torus. So the spectrum is the range of this function, which is minus 4, 4, as I said. So now let us add a magnetic field to this two-dimensional Laplacian. So what does it mean to add a magnetic field? It means to basically choose a gauge this is this assignment on the edges, A and B, such that when you go around a square, you incorporate the flux to pi alpha. 
So a good example is what is called Landau gauge, is when you assign each a to be just zero and b to be two pi m alpha, then you, when you go in the counterclock order, you exactly incorporate two pi alpha. And how does this gauge enter? You, it just enters as such uh, unit factors <coughs> in front of the corresponding connections. So this is uh, one representation of an operator of two-dimensional Laplacian subject to a perpendicular magnetic field, uniform magnetic field with flux alpha. Uh, so, once again, uh, uh, this, this actually idea to study <coughs> electrons in two-dimensional crystal subject to perpendicular magnetic field uh, first appeared in the work of Pyros in 1930s. But uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But let us uh, again go back to the spectrum. So if alpha is zero, we see, uh, we just figured out that the spectrum is an interval minus four four. So what is the spectrum when you turn on the alpha? Maybe very small or whatever. And it turns out that the picture is the following. So what is plotted here is spec uh, on the vertical have uh, various rational values of alpha. So if alpha is zero, it is here. And on the horizontal, you have the corresponding spectra. So if alpha is zero, the spectrum is minus four four. If alpha is one half, it becomes a two-periodic operator. The spectrum consists of this two-touching interval. If alpha is one-third, the spectrum becomes three-periodic, and the spectrum consists of these three intervals, and so forth. So you see this picture is very... features the self-similarity. So these little blocks are uh, distorted replicas of this big butterfly, and then every little block inside is a further distorted replica, and so on and so forth, ad infinitum. Uh, <coughs> a little bit of history here. Uh, this uh, model was first introduced by Pyrels in 1933, and uh, he wrote it down just like this, and he actually already did this one-dimensional reduction that I will talk about in a second in his work. But then he moved to some other projects, like Manhattan Project. And after the war, he, he decided to go back to important things. And he asked his student, Harper, to look at this model. And Harper published a paper in 1955 that actually didn't go much beyond Pyrrell's original work, I actually cannot see what is so new there. But as a result, this is called the Harper's model. And if you Google up the Harper's model, you'll see lots of hits, uh, uh, even if you Google up the Harper's model mass, because otherwise you get some hits that are not relevant. Uh, like you see thousands of hits. It, it's very, very popular in physics. And uh, also, uh, I want to mention that uh, this parameter lambda one can introduce if the lattice is anisotropic. It's also very natural. So, uh, as I said, this model turned out to be very lucky because somehow it keeps being relevant to the coolest physics things. And I will not talk much about it. I'll just show this is one illustration. It turned out that this model was proposed by Taulis as uh, being in the foundation of the theoretical interpretation of the quantum Hall effect. This is uh, a pictorial representation produced by Avron and Asachi. This, uh, Colors correspond to churn numbers, uh, different uh, blue colors for negative, red colors for positive, but uh, again, I will not explain that further. So, uh, 
actually, the interest was uh, really picked up uh, not after uh, Parrell's or Harper's work, but after Hofstadter, who was also then a PhD student, produced this numerical plot. There is uh, quite an amazing story of how he came up with it against his advisor's will. But uh, notice that it was in 1976. It uh, was probably the very first uh, beautiful numerically produced fractal in mathematics before the word fractal was coined by Mandelbrot. So it, uh, uh, I should note actually that quite remarkably, so this was a purely numerical result, numerical observation, but quite remarkably, the fact that there could be something like that was actually predicted by Mark Asbel uh, much earlier in 1964 before computers, and it's quite mysterious to me how he could have predicted it, but it didn't... Oh, nobody paid attention to it then, and I think Hofstadter didn't know about it. Uh, but anyway, so in 1976, it created quite a stir. David Jennings described it as a picture of God, and Hofstadter wrote in his best-selling book, Gödel, Escher, and Bach, that in his view, this Jennings description is not blasphemous at all. So uh, this model uh, keeps attracting a lot of interest. So you see there are lots of other beautiful uh, and recognizable structures embedded here. This is a cover of a book, a recent physics book, entirely devoted to this model. But uh, let me... Uh, also mentioned that this uh, model has attracted quite a few prizes. There are several Nobel Prizes directly related to it, so Quantum Hall Effect that is the region that I mentioned, and Taules Prize for Topological Insulator also is partially related to his theoretical explanation, and then Graphene is related because you see such butterflies in graphene. Quasi-crystals is obviously related because it is a quasi-crystal. And then there are some mathematical prizes like Fields Medal and Ladizhinsky Prize, right? So basically, uh, if you are a young student thinking of what to work on and you want to win some prizes, I think this model is a champ. Okay. So... But let me talk about the mass origins now and uh, go back. I finally need to explain. So far, it was this two-dimensional operator. So where does one-dimensional operator come from? And uh, you see this guy, we have written it in this Landau gauge, and this becomes periodic in one variable. So by just block locate theory, it's easy to see that it's unitarily equivalent to the direct integral in theta in this phase, which is quasi-momentum in the original uh, two-dimensional problem of such operators, that, uh, specifically with the cosine here. And uh, it's unitarily equivalent to the direct integral, but each individual operator, of course, has a life of its own, and such operator Oh, and such family of operators indexed by parameter theta uh, is called the almost Matthew operator. The name was coined by Barry Simon in the early 80s, and Barry Simon actually laid uh, a lot of foundations to this field, and he coined many names that stuck and made the field popular, like Ten Martini problem, etc. And in fact, he uh, liked to formulate problems, and in his list of 15 problems in mathematical physics in 1985, three were devoted to this particular operator. And then he doubled down on that in his list of problems in mathematical physics in the 21st century, published in 2000. Again, there are three problems devoted to this particular operator. 
But I should note that it's fruitful to also replace the cosine by some other function. And it also comes from physics in the same way, because you just take another two-dimensional interaction and you obtain another function in place of the cosine. It is just the easiest and most natural interaction leads to this cosine thing. Okay, so why is uh, it is uh, particularly cool to study one-dimensional operators versus any other dimension? Because it becomes a dynamical system problem. Because uh, if you look at the eigenvalue problem, it can be written in terms of the so-called transfer matrix because you just rewrite it uh, in such a matrix form, this equation. And uh, so, uh, in particular, the solution at n and minus one is related to the initial solution by the product of such matrices along the rotation of the circle. So, uh, and it can be viewed as a dynamical system. In general, if you have some uh, matrix, uh, uh, some function mapping the circle into SL to C, uh, then uh, you can view, you can define a so-called quasi-periodic co-cycle. Uh, namely, I'm sorry for this E here, it shouldn't be here, it should be just A. And uh, the quasi-periodic co-cycle is a pair alpha and this matrix function A, A is a function from the circle into SL to C, that maps, in this case, the circle times C2 into itself, and it maps uh, element of the circle, it shifts it by alpha and the vector V into A of A to V, so it's a skew product. And this is a so-called quasi-periodic co-cycle. In particular, what comes from Schrodinger operators are, is, is a specific form called Schrodinger co-cycles when this matrix that depends on theta is of this form. And in general, for co-cycles, one can define by Kindman's additive ergodic theorem the Lapunov exponent. It is well defined. And uh, moreover, one can, of course, consider higher dimensional co-cycles, not uh, SL2C, but higher dimensional matrices, uh, d-dimensional matrices, and then one can define, for d-dimensional matrices, there will be in general d lapun of exponent, which are defined by such limits where sigma k uh, is a k singular value of the matrix AN. AN, remember, is a product of uh, A of X, A of X plus alpha, etc., n times. So, uh, and what is the connection between the dynamics and the spectrum? And there is a very nice connection. Turns out that it's called Johnson's theorem. Energy E is not in the spectrum of, or in the spectrum of H, if and only if the co-cycle as a dynamical system is not uniformly hyperbolic. So, in this sense, spe the spectrum <coughs> of an operator, of one-dimensional operator, is precisely the bifurcation set for this one-dimensional uh, parameter family of dynamical systems. And in general, Schrodinger co-cycles turned out to be the simplest classes of dynamical systems that are compatible with both KM phenomena and non-uniform hyperbolicity. So, uh, going back to the almost meta operator, there is this nice, actually, it uh, turns out that Leponov exponent can be simply computed on the spectrum for irrational alpha. And uh, simply, it turns out that one can go, uh, so you, you, you see, it, uh, Lapunov exponent is bigger than zero if and only if this lambda is bigger than one. 
And of course, Laponov exponent measures exponential growth of solutions potentially. And the biggest difference is, in some sense, between the situation when it is zero and when it is not zero. And indeed, but with a little catch, uh, by now there are very well developed methods and many, many beautiful results that all suggest that for lambda less than one, so-called subcritical, because lambda equal to one is called the critical value, there is a metal-like behavior in this model, uh, manifesting in many, many ways. And for lambda larger than one, called supercritical, there is insulator-like behavior, but uh, there is a lot more complexity there in some sense. And so, and there are different methods based on reducibility for this region, based on localization for this region. For lambda equal to one, the critical value, it's a boundary of both regions. It's a lot more mysterious and it's still less understood. Uh, so let me now talk about a very powerful idea of complexification of analytic co-cycles. I think it goes back to Michel Hermann, who in 83 probably used this idea for the first time, as far as I know, to actually show the inequality. It turned out to be equality on the spectrum, but he showed the inequality for the almost Matthew operator by studying the complexification and subharmonic methods, very simple and beautiful argument. So what do I mean by complexification? You can just, uh, if it is an analytic function, uh, a of x, so you can consider uh, a of x plus i epsilon. And similarly, the Lyapunov exponent exists, so you can define L epsilon. So the power of complexification was really, uh, has really come to light in uh, Arthur's Arthur Avila's work in 2010 called Global Theory. And it is, I will not talk fully about it, but it is <coughs> based in some sense on studying this L epsilon as a function of epsilon. And in particular, he observed that this is a convex function. And uh, that means that this, this object that he called acceleration, so just a derivative, uh, and zero of this guy is well defined. And again, I will not talk much about it, but basically uh, the substance is that <clears throat> he proposes the division of the spectrum into three regimes that uh, modeled by the almost matter, he called them subcritical, supercritical, and critical. And the biggest part is that critical generically does not exist. Uh, quite annoyingly, it does exist for the almost matter, but generically it doesn't. And in the subcritical, uh, which is defined uh, uh, be because you, you see for the almost matter in both critical and subcritical upon of exponent is zero on the spectrum, but there is a big difference. And uh, Arthur defined subcritical by not only upon of exponent being zero on the spectrum, but also this acceleration being zero. And uh, more or less, the goal is to show that uh, in the subcritical regime, everything is more or less like <clears throat> for in the subcritical almost matter regime, and it's largely achieved. And uh, for supercritical regime, where Lyapunov exponent is positive on the spectrum, uh, again, the goal is to show that largely things are like for the super, supercritical almost matter, and again, in some sense, uh, it is partially achieved. Uh, but one important discovery in the Tartar's paper is that this quantity acceleration, this derivative, is quantized. Namely, it only takes integer values. So if then, if you plot uh, this function, L is a function of epsilon, uh, like that, so that is how it looks. 
All the slopes are integers here. We take two pi epsilon on this axis. And uh, of course, once something is necessarily an integer, there is some topology involved. And indeed, uh, these uh, slopes are certain winding numbers, but still, uh, it's been quite mysterious. Uh, several things. First of all, what are these epsilons? They are clearly intrinsic features of your operator. So how can one, what can one say about them? And actually, other than uh, why are slopes exactly, uh, what are these slopes? So they are uh, winding numbers, but it doesn't, saying that doesn't reveal much. But if you think of this picture, <coughs> you may realize that you have seen it somewhere before. And where you've seen it is the classical Jensen's formula. Because here is a little non-standard way to write the classical Jensen's formula, but it is actually uh, the classical Jensen's formula, nothing else. And if you plot this as a high epsilon as a function of epsilon, you get precisely this same graph. And these guys, the turning points, are logarithms of the absolute values of zeros of the function f. And uh, the slopes are the number of zero up to the, of zeros in the circle of the corresponding radius. So it has very uh, clear meaning. Now, I want to observe that, of course, everyone knows Jensen's formula, but uh, to a dynamical systems person, Jensen's formula can also be viewed as a formula for the Lyapunov exponent of a SL1 seco cycle. It's an obvious statement, kind of, because the integral to this guy, because it is just the sum of identical quantities divided by n, so it's also equal to the limit. So it's an obvious statement that the weapon of exponent of a SL1 seco cycle is equal to this logarithmic integral. And therefore, this graph is indeed the graph of the behavior of the Lyapunov exponent as a function of epsilon. And uh, then, uh, so you see, uh, of course, this is a trivial Lyapunov exponent because everything is commutative and, uh, right, but, it's a very natural question whether there exists a multiplicative analog or non-commutative analog, if you will, of the Jensen's formula. Because like you have ergodic theorem for functions and then you have multiplicative ergodic theorem for matrices. So it is very tempting by looking at these two graphs to think that there is a multiplicative version. And indeed, there is. So this is true for Lyapunov exponents of Schrodinger core cycles. You see that it is the same exactly as Jensen's formula, where the roles of the logarithms of absolute values of zeros is played by the object that we call dual Lyapunov exponents. And let me explain what this is. Uh, but before I do, so basically, this demystifies, this answers those questions that I asked about this mystery objects in global theory. What are these turning points and what are the slopes? The turning points are just dual Lyapunov exponents. In some sense, these are Lyapunov exponents of the dual model. I will explain it in a second. And uh, the slopes are the number of dual Lyapunov exponents less than a given epsilon. So to explain what the, these dual Lyapunov exponents are, I'll just briefly mention that there is this central uh, technique, central transformation in all this quasi-periodic business called the bridge duality, which is basically 
a map from so <coughs> remember we discussed that this two-dimensional operator is unitarily equivalent to the direct integral of one-dimensional operators in the Landau gauge. So this uh, L2 of S1 cross Z, you can think of it as the space on this on which this direct integral acts. So this is a unitary from this L2 of S1 cross Z into itself that simply acts as a certain skewed Fourier transform. Uh, and uh, it has been explored on many, many different levels and has been extremely fruitful in this theory. But actually, understanding what this is uh, pictorially is very easy because remember this original two dimensional operator in magnetic field, if you choose different gauges, you get a unitarily equivalent operator. So this transform actually corresponds to simply a different gauge, to the pi over two rotation of the gauge. It's a very natural transform if you look, remember the two dimensional nature of the model. And so what are these dual Lyapunov exponents? Well, under this transform, this operator family, indexed by x, turns into a dual family uh, indexed by theta, where you have this uh, toplets matrix with Fourier coefficients of v uh, 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 on the lines parallel to the diagonal, and this cosine. Uh, for the potential. So, uh, as you see from this formula, the uh, special nature of almost, the almost Matthew family is that it is self-dual with respect to this operator in some sense, but to, to this transformation. But uh, in general, that's how the duality works, because the discrete Laplacian under the Fourier transform turns into multiplication by the cosine, and V turns into this. And uh, it's a little more complicated when V is an analytic function, but let's think for a second that uh, V is a trig polynomial, and then it's a finite sum. And similarly to how we did it before, we can study it as a dynamical system, and it turns into, it leads to a symplectic SP2D cycle. And this cycle has Lyapunov exponents. And our dual Lyapunov exponents are precisely the Lyapunov exponents of this dual cycle. In the analytic case, we actually prove that there are certain lim limiting objects that exist. And <coughs> note that from this point of view, one can also understand the classical Jensen's formula spectrally. Because if you look at the pure diagonal operator, with v of x plus n alpha on the diagonal, then uh, its Lyapunov exponent is precisely equal by, to the logarithmic integral, right? Because it's limit of the logarithms of this product, of integral of the logarithms of this product over x divided by n. So this is precisely the logarithmic integral. And the dual operator becomes a constant to toplets matrix. And then you can write down the corresponding constant symplectic cycle. And its Lyapunov exponents are simply its eigenvalues. One can compute them. And this computation precisely gives uh, logarithms of absolute values, of the absolute values of zeros. So <laughs> what does this tell us? This tells us that you thought you knew what are the zeros of analytic functions, right? But in reality, logarithms of the absolute values of zeros of analytic functions are Lyapunov exponents, they are dual Lyapunov exponents, right? That's the proper and generalizable way to view them. Uh, and uh, all this has various very nice spectral corollaries. And for example, I'll just give one quick corollary. One can fully characterize the spectrum of an analytic operators with analytic potential by Lyapunov exponent and the dual Lyapunov exponent. The spectrum is precisely the set when at least one of those is zero. Okay, so I will now move 
to the second topic that excites me the most currently, and this is sharp analysis of small denominators. And uh, let me introduce small denominator problems first. And uh, you see, these problems appear immediately when, and appeared historically, people started thinking of them when they started thinking of the, about the problem of the stability of celestial motion. Because uh, two-body problem can be solved, at least some people can solve it, and uh, we know the solutions very well. But of course, in reality, Celestial bodies are subject to many, many forces. There are many, many bodies. It's just small perturbations, but the motion should be stable with respect to the small perturbation, and then it should be provable. And already with the three-body problem, which uh, you encounter an issue. And this problem really preoccupied Henri Poincaré, who actually solved it in 1889. He wrote a paper on the problem of the three bodies and the equation of dynamics. And this paper really answered this question of stability of celestial motion, for three bodies at least. Everybody was very happy. And it won the King Oscar Prize. And it was scheduled to be published by Acta Mathematica on the King's birthday. But then Fragman and Poincaré independently found errors, so this is a dramatic story. Poincaré spent more than the prize money to withdraw all the issues of the journal. But it led eventually, pretty soon actually, to his almost 1,000-page monograph called New Methods in Celestial Mechanics where he actually, this, this monograph presents the discovery of, the, of chaos theory, foundations of modern dynamical systems, and led to separation between mathematicians and astronomers over convergence of series. And uh, Poincaré writes there that the difficulties encountered in celestial mechanics because of the small dominators and the quasi-commensurability of the mean motions cannot be avoided. It's highly probable that they will come up whatever method we use. So what are the small denominators and why do they appear? Because you see, if you have even three bodies, and if uh, this two orbits have very, very similar periods, then when you try to do the perturbation theory, you'll immediately encounter this issue with convergence of series because some of the denominators already in the first terms will be very small. I'll show it in practice on an easier problem in a second. Uh, so, and you see, this is the real picture of the rings of Saturn, and you clearly see that it's a counter set, right? It's all uh, because of the small denominators. Okay, so let me just briefly list for you to understand the issue with small denominators, two classical problems. One is the problem of complex linearization. Uh, so if you have... Uh, Holomorphic function that uh, starts with lambda z, and can you by, uh, by holomorphic conjugation to conjugate it back to lambda z? Suppose even f is small. And of course, you want to solve this problem by, uh, so it's a, if it is a uh, f is a holomorphic function, right? So it is written like that, and if g is a holomorphic, so you can write it like that, and then you can solve it term by term. You can actually compute the terms, and that's how they look like. And the question becomes a question of convergence. And it's not difficult to see that if lambda this parameter lambda is not equal to one in absolute value, then there is perfect convergence. Because remember, Fn's decay exponentially. But what if lambda 
is uh, equal to one in absolute value. And in 1927, Kramer showed that if you actually take very specific this, this square here, then the answer is no, at least for some alpha. There is a topologically large set of these alphas here, such that there is a periodic orbit in every neighborhood of zero. So no chance, of course, that you can conjugate it to just lambda z. But uh, in 1942, Siegel solved this problem under the Diophantine time condition. And so this Diophantine condition probably first appeared in this type of problem then. Uh, and so then one can show convergence. And there was a complete arithmetic solution by Yokos in 95. So for alphas satisfying the Bruno condition, there is convergence, and not satisfying, there is not. It's such a beautiful, if and only if result. A similar uh, question is diffeomorphism of the circle. If you take a diffeomorphism with rotation number alpha, even a small perturbation of the rotation by alpha, can one conjugate it to a rigid rotation? And again, this problem <coughs> was of interest to Henri Poincaré, who found that, yes, you always have global continuous conjugation. Dinja proved that, actually, it is a homeomorphism. But the question is, can you find actually a smooth global perturbation? And again, if you start to solve it formally, you immediately obtain a cohomological equation like that, which is actually very typical for this sort of business, which again easily, is easily solved formally. And you can see that small denominators appear and convergence will depend on the arithmetic properties of alpha. And uh, this was uh, uh, one of the first problems solved by KM method by Arnold under the Diophantine condition. It was made global by Erman. And again, optimal arithmetic solution was found with the same Bruno condition by Yokos. So the big answer to this question of um, how to deal with small denominators ca came in the celebrated KM theory. And basically, again, I will not explain what it is, but basically the theory is about persistence under perturbation of quasi-periodic motion in Hamiltonian dynamical systems, because if you take an integrable system, then the phase space is foliated into the tori on each of which you have this quasi-periodic motion. So if you take a small perturbation, uh, kind of the theory says that most in the Liouville measure, measure sense tori persist. This was uh, a theorem by stated by Kolmogorov in 1954 and proved independently by Arnold and Moser some years later. It's a remarkable story about it. But uh, so basically it provided a consistent but uh, quite difficult still way to deal with the small denominators, a way that you, you still you, you need an art to apply it every time. So in every concrete problems. And uh, standard weaknesses also, they have been overcome in various situations, even in our business, uh, but standard weaknesses are that it is generally a very, uh, only can be applied for perturbations as it was designed, and uh, that the smallness condition for the perturbation is usually related to Diophantine constants and and therefore, typically cannot hold for full measure sets. And what does it have to do with all this? Because ergodic Schrodinger operators, and particularly quasi periodic operators, present another case of small denominator problems. Actually, there are two separate small denominator problems embedded here. Because if lambda is small, the system is close to constant coefficients. So basically, if you see if this term is zero, then you get 
blocker block solution, you have this your quasi periodic motion. So it's very natural to expect that it will persist by KM type methods. And uh, at least for Alpha Diophantine. And actually, this was first done in the pioneering work by Dina Burgensy 9, 1974, so before the Hofstadter. So actually, this may also be seen as the beginning of this quasi periodic uh, field, uh, because this was also very influential. The final solution, uh, perturbative solution, came in by Eliasson in later on. And there is also another small denominator problem if lambda is large, because then you can rewrite it like that. And you can view it as a perturbation of the purely diagonal operator. And again, this leads to, because if your original operator is ergodic, so these coefficients Vn are dense in a certain set, any perturbation theory will encounter small denominators like that. Another way to understand it is to look at the time-dependent Schrodinger operator. And again, if the, the, the part is purely diagonal, all solutions are nice quasi-periodic, right? If you start, for example, with a wave packet with only finitely many excited eigenmodes, then the solution is simply this, it's a quasi-periodic motion, right? So for lambda minus one equal to zero, all the motion is purely quasi-periodic. And thus, uh, it's natural to expect that for large lambda or small lambda minus one, one can somehow apply KM in infinite dimensional space if alpha is different. Another, yet another way to see it is if you look at the formal expansion of the Green's function, you see this small denominators appear. Oops. <laughs> uh, so uh, similar problems appear in uh, nonlinear Schrodinger and nonlinear wave equation, very simple problems. And uh, again, uh, this has been approached by KM. Dinaburg Sinai and Sinai for Alex Spencer Witt were Eliasson in this business. And uh, for Hamiltonian PDEs, there were a lot of papers in the 90s by Cooks and Bain, Craig and Burgen, especially. And this non KM methods uh, that uh, started from my work for the almost major operators, but really developed by Jan Burgen for a lot more general situations when he added this technique of semi-algebraic sets, they have led to much stronger results in all this business. So for example, before uh, all results were dimensional, one frequency, uh, cosine type non-arithmetic for Schrodinger and now, there is uh, all this business. And for nonlinear Schrodinger, before only dimension one and two can be treated even by Burgen, but uh, now you could treat anything. And all this is described in his book published in 2005. And again, uh, so as I said, it started with my papers, but. Burgen and also with collaborators, Goldstein, Schlag, and myself a little bit have uh, developed it into something really powerful. And uh, I want to popularize uh, this, some of recent papers, which uh, include some state of the art on this business. But uh, finally, I want to mention that another very important property of this method is that it goes beyond the Bruno condition, so way beyond the KM territory. And there is a different arithmetic threshold, and, which is given by this number. And it allowed to solve several problems, just like Yoko solved this other problem that I mentioned. It allowed to solve several uh, quasi-periodic problems up to the actual arithmetic threshold, so I list those problems here. And then is it allowed some really wonderful analysis um, uh, of self-similarity in the structure of eigenfunctions, so uh, there is this uh, 
precise structure that happens around every local maximum. So you have this picture, like at the beginning of the talk, where you do have self-similarity. You see it precisely, and you can describe it precisely in the function. And this is how papers with Vincelu and some current ongoing work. Thank you very much. For a, for a really uh, very comp comprehensive and, and, and beautiful talk. So, uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, we have some time for that uh, outside, uh, back there. Yeah, so I was, I was wondering, like, if there, is there some a priori heuristic reason why you expect this operator to have a fractal spectrum? Uh, say it again, I didn't hear uh, Is there some, like, intuitive reason for why you would expect this operator to have a fractal spectrum? Uh, well, uh, so, uh, yeah, so... Uh, and first of all, you really see, so for each, uh, for each particular gap, so these gaps can be labeled by certain rotation numbers, like pictures in this colored butterfly. So for each particular gap, you can easily, quite easily see by perturbation theory that it persists for, so, this, so that it stays for small, so sufficiently small, say, coupling. So uh, you do see these gaps opening quite easily by perturbation theory, but only this only gives you finitely many gaps for each fixed lambda. Um, one special reason, because you see, for example, if you take rotation on the two-dimensional torus, it's uh, not expected, and it's proved in some cases that spectrum is not a counterset. So it's a special feature of the rotation of one-dimensional torus. And one potential, one explanation is that kind of resonance is the same phenomena that makes difficult to prove point spectrum, to prove localization, that they, in this one-dimensional setting, that they create gaps in the spectrum. Because uh, uh, this is, uh, there is uh, this uh, picture that appeared in Sinai's uh, 87 paper, for example, where you see you, uh, again, if, if you look at uh, the pure diagonal operators, so you, you can plot eigenvalues, it's just a cosine, and then you shift. And then there are two branches where cosine and shifted cosine intersect. And there is a pretty simple mechanism that uh, shows that, uh, suggests, it's not easy to show at all, but that somehow suggests that it leads to a certain repulsion in the perturbed eigenvalues. So this has been, this is one intuitive mechanism, but it actually only works in the regime, in the so-called supercritical regime. But in the subcritical regime, there is this also perturbative mechanism that somehow allows to show that each individual gap persists. But the fact that it holds throughout all parameters and throughout <coughs> uh, all couplings, all arithmetic parameters is actually kind of a little bit of a lucky situation, I think. It's not entirely clear why it should be like that. Okay, thanks. Okay. There's one more. Instead of complexifying uh, to SL2C, if we restrict it to SL2 of some finite field, do you have yeah, Sorry, sense? can you say it again? Instead of going from SL2R to SL2C? Yes. 
go to some finite field and then study the properties. Finite field? Yeah. Uh, no, that's not my territory at all. Sorry, I don't think. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, our program is approaching its end, so if there are no other questions. Let's thank Svetlana again. <laughs> thanks, thanks and con congratulations once more. And uh, of course, on behalf of our conference, uh, thank you for uh, uh, Marie-Francoise and uh, the uh, WMWM people of, of uh, giving us the opportunity to have this this, uh, this session here, and thanks to Arthur, of course, for the beautiful laudatio. And maybe Marie Francoise wants to say something still. No, I have no much uh, to add. Just to to say that this is the closing of this uh, OEL celebration. We are very happy that it was uh, done together with the PMP uh, meeting so that we, we can be here live with a, a group of people uh, involved in this uh, mathematical uh, topic. And for us also at the end of our uh, WM Square meeting, uh, which we hope to be live uh, in the future. Okay, so. Mm. Many thanks for doing that uh, together with us. Thank you. So uh, this is an ICM. Uh, thanks, Svetlana, for uh, this uh, brilliant lecture. It was a uh, it was a pleasure to chair uh, this session. There was uh, there's no time enough for uh, questions in this case, but uh, I'd like to take the opportunity as uh, by sharing the, the last se plenary session of this ICM to get a well-deserved thanks to some people, but uh, I actually would like to give this opportunity to, to Svetlana, who is here to join us uh, live. Svetlana, please. Thank you very much, Arthur, and uh, it's indeed a great honor to be the last speaker and to get to say say thank you to the organizers of this congress both to the original organizers especially andre okunkov and stas smirnov who really did a great job putting together what's supposed to be a great live congress but uh, and uh, to the to Carlos and all the others who saved the Congress uh, in these extraordinary times and uh, made a great virtual Congress as it has just happened. Uh, it is really amazing how it was done basically in no time and in no budget, and it's turned out to be a truly amazing congress and amazing experience and to thank everybody who worked on that and uh, definitely to thank the audience uh, for uh, there were uh, 7000 people who signed up uh, and many many people could not sign up uh, to watch it live and it is kind of amazing uh, to have such an audience. It's very special for this Congress. And thank you very much, everyone.